thanks for coming out in the rain uh, to have a conversation with me. Um, so I work for an organization called Forefront. Uh, we're a statewide organization for grant makers and nonprofits across Illinois. And I am the director of what we call the Democracy Initiative, so focused on all things civic engagement. And as you know, this is a pivotal time in our American history um, to be engaged in the civic engagement space. Um, and so we've got a three-year program that focuses on traditional civic engagement, voter reg, voter education, uh, voter enhancement, and taking that a step further for a full um, count for the census in Illinois, a fair, accurate, and coordinated count, which is coming up in 2020. So I just kind of want to go through some slides of information um, that will help you to think more about how uh, the civic tech space can be involved in the census efforts in our state. So Forefront um, is working on this in a couple of different areas, right? We've got um, our democracy initiative, right, as I mentioned, that focuses on civic engagement, but then the census work. So we want to be able to engage our grant makers, right, which is part of our membership, as well as our nonprofits, right, the tried and true community leaders, many of whom you connect with um, on a regular or daily basis in, within your neighborhoods and your communities. And we really need them. They are what we call the trusted messengers in, able, in, in being able to help us with these efforts. And so um, I'll go a little bit more into this later, but I just kind of wanted to show you this because it helps break up the work that we do at Forefront, particularly in this democracy space. We engaged as of January of last year. Uh, our civic engagement work, we were not as involved in the primaries as we were in the general. We had 20 micro grantees across the state in the nonprofit space that really showed up and helped um, no, um, individuals understand the importance of registering to vote, but also the importance of taking that step further and making sure that people actually voted on, on election day. And one of the ways that we did that was we worked uh, very much in tandem with Ballot Ready. Many of you might be familiar with them. Um, they've got a presence in all 50 states now. They've got an online medium that helps people make informed decisions when they're at the polls. And after we've had great success in getting thousands of people across Illinois registered, we recognized that we wanted to also engage them in our census work. And so um, through our statewide advocacy coalition and our funders collaborative, we have now engaged many of the grantees that we had in our voter engagement space, what we call all vote, um, to also be participants and um, actively engaged leaders in our census work. So why is the census important, right? And, and what is the census, right? Before I delve into all of the uh, proactive measures that we're taking, right? Um, so the census is our civic duty. It's taking it a step further and ensuring that everybody is counted. Why? The census is important for three main reasons. Our congressional representation, right? The federal dollars that we receive in any given year based off of our state population and the information that is then derived, all that data, right, that we take based off our count to help us determine how we're gonna plan for the future, right? So where will our childcare facilities go? Where will there be new roads? Where do we have to invest less so that we can invest more in other parts of our city or other parts of our state? Um, congressional representation. So this one's a really important one because, let's be honest, this helps feed into uh, um, into redistricting, right? And helps determine then what the map looks like for the next decade ahead. Um, and this, so this would be what you call the precursor to redistricting. And what should be a very non-political, very bipartisan count often becomes political because it's tied to redistricting. And so since 1950, um, Illinois has lost one congressional seat in every census cycle. So you can imagine, for our redistricting purposes, what that means for our Illinois map, right? So in 1950, we had 24 congressional representatives in our Illinois delegation. We are now down to 18, with two um, statewide senators. That means that we are most likely looking to lose another congressional seat, but if we don't work together, 
I would argue that this is the one issue for our state that really impacts everybody across all sectors. If we don't work together, we're very likely going to lose a second seat, right? The first seat may come from central or southern Illinois. That second seat could very likely come from the greater Chicago area. Second issue, these federal funds. So there's a really great study George Washington University's um, Professor Andrew Reamer put together. I would really encourage you to look into this um, study. It's called Counting for Dollars, and it really breaks out about how much money each state gets based off of their census count. So based off of 2010 numbers, right, there are about 16 big social service programs that Illinois receives money for based off of our 2010 count. That comes out to about $20 billion annually for these 16 programs. Now you can break this down and go even deeper, and it could be over 55 social programs that would show that we receive almost $35 billion annually. So what does that, that come out to? That's about $200 billion over the course of the decade that we've received based off our census count. And we also know that in 2010, our census count was kind of middle of the pack in the country. We weren't at the 90% reporting. We weren't even at the 95. We were at 77%. And while some might say that that's not a bad turnout, um, that means that there's still considerable amount, more than 25% of Illinois' population, that wasn't accounted for. And so when you think about it in terms of numbers per person, the average number, based off of Reamer's study, sh says that there's about $1,800 a person that will go unaccounted, on average, across the country. One person, right, in the country over the course of one year. That's $18,000 over the course of the next decade that any given state will be losing out on. Now that number will probably look a little different for Illinois. I don't have those exact specifics because it could be anywhere about $1,000 a person, let's say on the low end, right? But that's then $10,000 for just one person that's not accounted for. That's $10,000 that could go to Cairo, that could go to Carbondale, that could go to Springfield, that could go to one of the specific neighborhoods in our city that would go for social service programs. That all individuals, regardless of your citizenship status, regardless of your voting status, right? All residents in our state utilize in some way, shape, or form. And if they don't, then one of their family members may. Right? So that it's really imperative that we think about those undercounted communities, that they are the ones that um, are accounted for so that we have those federal dollars to rely on. And let's be honest, we're in a state that's perennially broke. Right? We've got a state budget that in any given legislative cycle is always a fight. And we had a huge two-year budget impasse right, recently in our, um, in our history. Um, I would argue probably the longest and hardest state budget fight that we've had. That impasse lasted more than 24 months and severely impacted our nonprofit community. So the other piece that I wanted to bring to your attention of why is this census data important is that it really does help us think about building our future. So when we're in a state of constantly being reactionary, right, this is a real opportunity for us to be proactive, right? For us to think about how are we going to use the information that is derived next year in terms of the various communities that live in our state. And so there's a really great map. It's called the Hard to Count Mapping Tool. Um, it's out of the City University of New York um, that helps you look at the various districts that had undercount in any given part of our state. Right? So you can look it up by congressional district, you can look it up by state legislative district, or even by county. And I would say that this has been a really powerful tool for Forefront when we've been doing our advocacy. So what we've started doing over the course of last year are community census briefings, bringing community leaders, elected officials, and philanthropy leaders together to have a conversation so that anyone from your community can come out, learn about the census, and learn about how they can be engaged. And when there are a number of challenges, which I will get into in a second, that are impacting the census and a, and a fair and accurate count, it's a really great way to educate early and often. And so I brought a printout of a specific congressional district 
to an elected official early last winter. I went to Congressman Bill Foster, went to his district office, and showed him the various pockets of undercount that were in his community in 2010. And so he's over the Aurora Joliet area, for those of you that may not be familiar. And of course, this is an issue that's important and impacts all our congressional representatives. Um, but when he saw the map, and he looked at the, the various pockets of red and orange that were in his given district, he didn't know that outside of Aurora that there were other pockets as well. And so he was like, what can I do? How can I help Anita? And it was a really great advocacy tool because I was then able to get him to do not one, not two, but three congressional briefings in his district in the course of the year. And he did the first clergy briefing, bringing community leaders from our our houses of worship together to start having this conversation to understand that it's everybody that's impacted by the census. And so we need to think about all of the various community leaders that need to come together in, in any given community to have that conversation of how do you educate and educate early and often. So how does an undercount happen? Well, an undercount happens because in any given census cycle, there will be pockets of communities or pockets of individuals that are not accounted for. We know that what we call the undercount, uh, we know are traditionally hard to count communities or hard to count populations. So when you think of this, you might immediately think of immigrant communities, mixed status families, undocumented communities, low income communities, and communities of color. But what we don't often think about are that the, that the undercounted are pockets of renters, right? Students that are at universities that live um, not in university housing, right? That are paired up in, in apartments. Um, uh, the homeless, the elderly, the disabled, the LGBT community, all of these are hard to count communities. Um, and I would say that the biggest community that went uncounted in 2010 are children, zero to five. There was a really great study out by the Annie E. Casey Foundation that came out last summer that indicated that about a million children between the ages of zero and five were not accounted for in the country. And there's actually a statistic that shows that that translates into about 100,000 children in Cook County alone that one went unaccounted for in our census count. That's 100,000 individuals that could have been accounted for in the census for Illinois alone. Think about how much money that would have brought in to our state. So of course, I've talked about what the traditional um, communities are, why it's important to be counted, and what um, those three areas are. But there are also, in any given census cycle, challenges. Challenges to the census in terms of budget shortfalls, right? There's a budget that's fought in Congress every year, and that helps then determine what monies go to the Census Bureau that is housed in the Commerce Department. Um, incomplete testing, there needs to be testing of the various, uh, of the actual form, and now that it's going to be going online for the first time, which I would argue is probably the biggest issue or biggest challenge with the Census going, you know, in, in going into 2020, uh, is that there are over 3,000 cybersecurity risks at this point in time that need to be addressed, that need to be funded appropriately so that you have the right people in place to test it and to ensure that it's safe for it to go live next spring. Um, and then you also need to be mindful that as we're educating and making folks aware of the census and why they need to self-report, that there's a huge digital divide in our country, right? And significant parts of our state. Like I would say that um, many of our uh, residents live in central and southern Illinois in these rural parts of our communities that don't have access to broadband. And if they do, they don't necessarily use technology in the same way that maybe some of the urban communities do. And with that lack of distrust, right, in government that is high right now across rural communities, the lack of access to broadband, and the fact that they may not use technology in the, sa in the same way, we need to be cognizant of how do we reach out to these communities so that they feel safe and that they understand that this is an opportunity to be counted online so that the Census Bureau can keep up with technology and that this could be a really great way of getting to that 80% or 90% of reporting for our state. But this cannot be done 
in, in a vacuum, right? It can't be done in silo. We really need our civic tech um, community to help libraries, to help community hubs, to help elected officials think through how can this be done in a manner that is meaningful and, and effective for a, for a fair and accurate count. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the other challenge that takes up a lot of energy and oxygen, um, that proposed citizenship question, right? So in spring of last year, this came up as a potential to be added to the census form. So the census can be responded to in three ways in 2020, right? The fact that it's going online and that that is what um, the Census Bureau really wants to be able to focus on in deriving that data. But you can also call in, right? There will be a call in feature available with about 12 different languages uh, for people to call in to the Census Bureau. Um, and then there'll also be the traditional paper form. But that form may only be going to maybe say a fifth or a fourth of our Illinois population and won't be shared until the fifth reminder that will go out to your postal address as a postcard. So every household will receive a postcard in early March that will have a specific code. And I think what's also really important to understand is that this census uh, code that is then provided to your household means that any individual that is residing in your house that day needs to be counted for in that space. And I think that's where there's a lot of confusion in that sometimes families count their children that are away at college when those students actually need to be accounted for or they're going to school. Or if you have a recent um, newborn or a new grandchild or a new niece or nephew, that you don't always think to include them in your count. But if they are living in your household on April 1st, 2020, they need to be accounted for in your census count. So that said, this citizenship question, right, that, that has been proposed is new. This has not been on a traditional census form since probably 1960. And it was taken off and removed and put on to the American Community Survey so that it could get a sampling across the country to help enforce the Voting Rights Act. Well, that was sufficient and that was enough for those purposes. By adding a proposed citizenship question to the census form now evokes a certain sense of fear in many communities of color, in immigrant families, undocumented families, and mixed status families, not to mention some low income families, right? So it, it is targeting a specific group of hard to count populations and making uh, many communities uncomfortable with wanting to fill out the form. And I would say that whether that question is now on the form or not, come spring of 2020, there's been a lot of uh, concern and fear out there already. That now these trusted leaders, um, these various um, community and elected officials that need to come together to help ensure that we have a safe count, has their work count up for, cut out for them, right? Because they need to ensure that people feel safe that people understand why, despite the fears that may be out there in self-reporting or, or reporting period, that, 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 that they need to understand that the risk is far greater for our state if they don't report. And we should also be um, mindful of the fact that the Census Bureau um, takes an oath, right? Every person that works there, right, is, um, is binded by an oath and, then, and understands that there's a huge confidentiality clause, that for 72 years, any information that is shared with the Census Bureau is protected for 72 years after each census cycle. And so um, if there is a violation of that, right, many of those um, cases may not have been enforced previously. There may be one or two cases over the course of the last couple of decades, but there is a violation that if you don't fill out the form properly, or if you do have an enumerator come to your door and you don't fill it out and they ask subsistent questions, that you could be in federal violation and that could be a fine. And that could be a fine upwards of almost $1,000 for a family. Um, not to say that it's been enforced before, I think there's been one or two incidents, but you don't know. That could be because the census is going online for the first time and there are more mechanisms in place in trying to get um, a more accurate count that there could be um, that enforcement if, if, if communities, if families, if households don't, don't self-report. 
So how do we get an accurate count? Understanding the why it's important, understanding the various challenges, and the fact that there isn't necessarily an education, because this happens, what, once every 10 years? It's easy to forget. It's not a regular priority. We need our community trusted messengers, and we need those effective messages. So there are two groups that I would say that if you're interested in digging in deeper to look at nationally, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Funders Committee on Civic Participation. Both of these groups have been engaged in the census space for the last three or four years, ramped up a lot of their work last year, and have great resources available. Um, the censuscounts.org national website has a ton of information, resources, graphics, um, toolkits that anybody can take um, and customize. So in order to do this, there's obviously a number of mobilization uh, building blocks that need to go into effect, right? I would look at this as very much of like a GOTV campaign, right? Get out the vote. Um, we call it GOTC, get out the count. And um, they, it uses very much of the same pieces, right, in being able to do this work so that we have a fair and accurate count, right? So securing campaign funding, targeting messages, um, this legal clarity is important because we need to know what's going to happen with that question, right, the citizenship question. So there are seven lawsuits that are currently out there nationally that are trying to kick the question off the form. Three of them already have decisions that have come in, right, opposing the question. Uh, four are still pending. The first one that actually had a decision made by one of the lower courts was the New York case, which is what Illinois is part of. Now that case was then appealed by the current um, presidential um, administration. They went into Supreme Court hearings last week, and now there's a decision pending by the end of June. Now end of June is important to note because that is the deadline for when the census forum needs to be able to go to the printer so that it can be printed and all the various materials that come with advertising and promotion can also be printed ahead of January 2020. And so the last part is also understanding and addressing the community concerns. So this is where I would say you come in, right? It's really important to see if you can put together a community hearing, a community town hall, to start talking about who needs to be at the table, how can you do this, and how can you do it effectively, right, across all industries. Because we also need to understand what are the concerns that are on the ground, right? We know that the question is causing fear amongst communities, but we need even more information and data about the um, census going online, right? How do we help communities? How, how do we help the elderly ensure that they understand the importance and, and being able to help people um, have the resources that they need to report? So mapping out these communities, right? Like I talked about Congressman Foster having that aha moment when he saw this, this map, right? How do we use that more effectively? How do we do a Twitter storm? Or how do we engage communities in a way that's meaningful for people to be able to utilize so many of these resources that are already available? How do we address these obstacles? How do we use social media to address those obstacles, right? That could be really powerful. At this point in time, I don't know of any um, app or any technology that's going to help people on um, Census Day 2020, which is April 1st. Uh, with the census going online, people have a longer grace period in, in, in filling out the form, right? Um, traditionally, that has not been the case. It's been a paper form that people need to fill out by April 1st. It needs to go into your mail, and, and if it doesn't, then you have um, subsequent ways of um, you know, door knockers or enumerators, as they call it, coming to your doors, right? We know that they may, that may happen, but we also know there might be phone calls. But how, like, that follow-up that happens, right, we need to ensure that people know what the steps are before we put certain communities or certain families um, in an uncomfortable situation uh, where they don't want door knockers coming to them to get additional information. And then, we need the identification, engagement, and mobilization of our trusted partners, right? So our introductory question was, who's already engaged in this space and who else? And so I would say, ahead of 2020, it's really incumbent for us to think about the unusual people that need to be in the table. 
So in any given census cycle, there are what we call local complete count committees, which are comprised of community members and elected officials, right? And um, the, the, in 2010, I think there was over 200 of them across our state. So while that was a really great effort in coordinating, um, no one community talked to another. So it was really vital that for Illinois to step up and get past the 77% that we think about those other people that need to be at the table, right? So the city just put together a steering committee of I would say about uh, maybe 30 individuals, uh, many of them that are from the business community. But we also know that Mayor Emanuel will be stepping down and we have a new mayor coming in. So this is our opportunity to think about can we have the city think about having monies appropriated, right, in the budget coming in, this, in the fall for an app or a social media campaign or an opportunity that we can bring technology to help us drive our messages and help our communities understand the importance of the census. It's a new day, it's, a, it's an opportunity, but we need you. We need our community leaders on various industries to think about how we make that happen. And then the other step that I would say is that um, from the philanthropy side, right, Illinois has been successful in raising $1.75 million. Forefront has been working with 22 foundations across the state in raising these funds because we know that nonprofits can't do this without capacity dollars, right? So any state can do this, right? We know that Michigan, Minnesota, um, New York are all looking into philanthropy to help, but philanthropy can't do this alone. We need government to step up and help us provide some capacity dollars. And so Forefront's been working through our statewide coalition um, with 40, 50 other nonprofit um, organizations across the state in helping us advocate for a state census appropriation. So in 2018, we went to the governor and the state assembly and asked for $5 million. We didn't do it in a traditional bill. We actually worked it behind the scenes for a line item. And while we didn't get $5 million, we did get $1.5 million. And that was a step forward. You know, a lot of states haven't even had those monies appropriated yet. But Illinois understood under Governor Rauner that we needed to start and we needed to start early, right? But this 1.5 million is still in the Secretary of State's office. It hasn't had a chance to get out yet to community. Meanwhile, Forefront's coalition is now fighting for additional dollars, as are other um, coalition members um, across the state. And so our ask at this point in time is anywhere between 25 and 33 million. Now, how, you, how we got to those numbers is, is a talk for another time. Um, but what's important to understand is that uh, we are asking the governor and imploring the state assembly to think about making that investment now because that will really help us in investing for our future. So how are we doing this in Illinois? We're doing this in three different ways. We've got our Illinois Complete Count Commission, we've got Ill uh, Forefront Advocacy Coalition, and then we've got the Funders Collaborative, right? So the Illinois Complete Count Commission, I wanted to bring this to your attention. Um, this is the first of its kind in the country, a real opportunity for Illinois to lead and to show that we can do this and do this well. This is by state statute. State Senator Emil Jones III um, created it in 2017. It was established last year, last spring, at the Secretary of State's office. It's got 22 members on the commission, and I believe the commission is actually looking to move to the lieutenant governor's office. So our new lieutenant governor will be presiding over this commission and helping these uh, commission members lead as additional community leaders across the state that are focused on all things census and help these various local count committees that are popping up all across the state, Aurora, Springfield, Joliet, Rockford, um, I've done a number of these kinds of conversations to help leaders then start pulling their leaders together um, to put their various committees together. So this is a real opportunity for us to shine at the national level, and it could really be that coordination piece, right? That could be the group that then has these various subcommittees bringing other leaders from hard-to-count communities together to think about how we get our messages out. Um, as I mentioned, our statewide advocacy coalition through Forefront, um, has already been focused on a state census appropriation, but what these um, 
nonprofit community groups have also been doing are connecting with other peoples within their various constituencies to think about how can they roll out a plan. And then finally, this is a funders collaborative that I mentioned. That Four Fund's been working with 22 funders across the state. These are some of the, these are the funders that are part of the collaborative, right? They understood the importance of investing and investing early. And from the 1.75 million that was, um, that was uh, raised, we now have 42 grantees that were announced at Forefront Census Summit uh, back April 3rd in Springfield, right? These 42 groups, I don't have the list here, but I do have um, the list on me. So if you're interested and you wanna know who these grantees are, let me know. Um, I can share that list with you. But these grantees that have been picked by this collaborative will now be the GOTC plan, at least through philanthropy side, for our state. Right? They will be the ones that will be invested in getting a fair and accurate count for our state from June of this year through June of next year. And so finally, I wanted to end on this. Um, so this is kind of the diagram of the work that's being done by the statewide um, collaborative. Right. Um, in the middle is what we're calling the steering committee. These are about 40 groups that come together quarterly to talk about how do we do stuff together, how do we do stuff that's still significant to our communities and our constituencies. And then we do the work on a monthly basis through the various four working groups. The GOTC one, that's made up of the 42 grantees from the Funders Collaborative. So it's been a lot of work in pulling this together last year, but I think it's really imperative that these um, are examples that can be taken by other communities and other leaders in, in, in figuring out how do we do this because you know central Illinois, how they engage is so different from southern Illinois, which is so different from how we engage in the greater Chicago area. Um, but this is our opportunity, this is our one chance to get it right for the next decade ahead. Um, so I would really implore you to think about how do we do this and, and how do we do this well. So thank you. So how do you, I know you talked a lot about how you can do it through like nonprofits and the government, um, but how do you think on an individual level can someone ensure that not even themselves but their family members in the community understand how important the, since the Count Me In is? Well, I think it depends on like if you've got like a community group or if you've got a student group. Um, I've been talking to universities about having student leaders put together talks, right, or social media campaigns, uh, you know, or, or figuring out like how, how do you get the messaging out there so that families understand, right? Or it's a block party, you know, you have information, you've got flyers. Like I think it's really about how can you be creative in the space to think about um, ways that you can share that information. Because it's not, it's not that it's hard information, right? It's just making sure that people understand to make time for it, to carve it out um, in, in, in everyone's busy lives. And I think it's also important that we're going to be in a really big presidential election year Right, where we're going to be having messages thrown at us by various candidates. Right, our primary is a month before. Right, in is March of next year, and that's going to be right around the time when the messaging for the census will start. So it can get diluted, and if that information is being shared with families through the postal service, right, a lot of people don't check their mails regularly. So I think that's an important piece to be able to share and educate families of that. Look out for your postcard that will have your, your specific code. Um, it, yeah, well, it may not be directly related to the administration of the census. Um, are you able to speak anything about kind of the, some of the absurd uh, gerrymandering that we've seen over, kind of over the years as, you know, as the census data kind of gets distorted? Um, you know, any, anything that we're doing to alleviate that, like people are talking about algorithms and stuff. Um. You know, I can't actually speak to the redistricting effort because I have not been engaged in it. Um, but what I can say is that I've never seen the census so politicized as it is in this census cycle because everybody knows that we've got a lot to lose. And so everyone is trying to stem, right, from, from losing their particular congressional seat or their particular um, state legislative seat. And so the jockeying for that has already started. Um, and I think that there needs to be some thought put into place right now of how do we fight for a fair map, right? We get to 2021, we've done this in the past and we've had, we've not had as much luck, 
right? And if we really wanted to, to stray away from gerrymandering and we really want to um, provide people a real opportunity, it's to think about being fair. Um, but we can't do that when we've got legislators in office who are willing to stick to the status quo. Um, and so there's this really great group called the Just Democracy Coalition um, that has been around for a couple of years, and they actually came together to fight for a fair map in 2011. Um, while their efforts were totally in the, in the right place, um, that's not how it turned out. And so I know that they're looking to engage again. So that might be a group that you might want to connect with, see if you can get involved with, and see if there's an opportunity um, for there to be some advancement. Um, so my question is about, I'm pretty sure like other government agencies besides the Census Bureau have pretty good counts of people in the US, such as like the NSA, FBI, IRS. Do they do any like coordination or checking just to make sure that, like how do you know Illinois has 77% turnout rate? Like I just wonder how to... The yeah, they, they certainly do. Um, so the Census Bureau has relationships with a number of the other agencies because that's a way of kind of fact checking right, and being able to make sure that the, the count that we're getting can be accounted for, because there are families or communities that may not report, right, and so we need to get to a baseline number. Um, so that has been, um, there's this thing called the LUCA program, the Local Update Census Addresses. It starts about two years before the census, or maybe three, um, and so Illinois has already had that effort um, occur, that happened during the Rauner administration. And so that is like the first step in a longer st uh, set of steps, right, that then help ensure that we get that information from the various agencies. Are you required to answer all the questions on your census form? That's a great question. Um, in theory, yes. Uh, but I believe that um, you can leave a, a number, like say there are 10 questions, you may be able to leave three or four empty and still be able to submit, especially as we go online. Um, uh, but the question is, if that citizenship question ends up on the form, as a 501c3 organization, you can't tell everyone, anyone not to fill it out because you need the best information. And if you don't fill it out, there is a chance that there could be a subsequent uh, call or a canvasser that may come to your door to get that information. Related to that, is it statistically proven that the citizenship, que the citizenship question will result in an undercount, or is this purely conjecture based on expected human behavior? Well, I can't speak to the statistical because I don't believe that that question has been on the forum in, since decades. But what I can say is that um, we have had focus groups conducted in the last year, year and a half, where they've asked if that question were on the forum, would folks feel comfortable? And these focus groups have been conducted nationally, and there have been numbers that have shown that it would severely depress the count. I have a question that follows up on the uh, other... Uh... So with the uh, census going online, will they uh, try to uh, get ways to answer that question as a requirement before you can submit a census form? So we connected with the Regional Bureau, um, which is based in Chicago for the Midwest. There are over eight states this time. Um, and to our knowledge, we were told that there, will be, there are two uh, sites that are being created at this point in time, one that would have the question on it, one that won't have the question on it. If the question is on it, I believe they've indicated that there will be information that's shared of how many questions can you get through. I think you can still choose to not answer that question and still move forward. Like there will be an arrow button, right, to move on to the next question. Um, that is my understanding. Now, how that rolls out, how it shakes out, we don't know yet. But we also know that the Bureau will need to give guidance um, and information of, of, of what that entails. All right, well, thank you so much. Everyone give another round of applause.